All right, so if you've never seen this, I just got live footage of the housing market where BlackRock just outbid a single mom and her five kids. When you find yourself at the club, you got a party like BlackRock. Now, the major question of this video is, are major institutions and hedge funds like BlackRock the reason that buying a house is becoming more and more expensive? You've probably seen this story. It's all over the internet and cable news and it's sparked a debate about what's really going on. On one side of the fence, people argue that corporations and institutions only own a small fraction of the housing market and there's far bigger reasons why houses are actually becoming more expensive. On the opposite side of the fence though, people argue that corporations are absolutely to blame. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., for example, says, the real reason that housing has outpaced everything else is because three giant corporations, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, already own 88% of the stock market, and now they're coming after single-family homes in America. And he predicts that by 2030, they'll own something like more than 60% of all the homes. And that sounds terrifying, but it also makes for an amazing headline that everybody wants to read. On the other hand though, I just watched a video from my friend Graham Stephan who was supposed to go on Fox News about this very same topic. And his opinion is that corporations only own a small percentage and they don't account for much of the buying of single family homes. And he gave some really good compelling data and evidence to support his argument. But instead of airing Graham's episode where he explains all that, Fox News decided to cancel and cut him out of it completely due to runtime issues. Now it's believed that the real reason they cut him out is because the real reason is not as exciting and doesn't make for compelling TV, when instead, we could all collectively be mad at an evil corporation that's responsible for all of it. But Graham's video inspired me to make this one to do a deeper dive. But if you haven't seen Graham's, go check out his channel because it's an awesome video. Now personally, I've always been somewhere in the middle. I've always thought, surely corporations must have something to do with the higher costs. And you might be thinking, Andre, don't call me Shirley. But I could never argue with the data that I saw because that same data shows that institutions only own one to 2% of housing. So they couldn't be making that much of a difference, right? Right? So someone who is not a real estate agent or an investor, I wanna to get to the bottom of this, mostly for myself, because it's something that I've been conflicted and confused about, especially when it comes to BlackRock. So let me share with you what I found and let's get into it. Hi, my name is Andre Jick. Hope you're doing well. Come for the finance and stay for BlackRock. So rumor has it that by 2030, BlackRock will account for over 90% of all the like buttons that are smashed and we must not let them win. So before you leave your opinion on this video, please watch it all the way through until the end because just when you think you know where it's going, it's gonna flip and take you on a roller coaster ride. But let's start with just how shocking it is, how much we all agree that Wall Street really is to blame to some degree. So much so, in fact, that this happens to be one of the only things that both the left and right actually agree on. But are they actually responsible for prices going up? Let's take a look at one of the biggest culprits in the world, BlackRock. There's a popular conspiracy going around that they control and own the entire world. But if that was true, their share price probably wouldn't be down 8% this year. And Larry Fink, who's their CEO, probably wouldn't look like this. He just doesn't look like an evil villain to me. Unless, of course, he's the master of disguises. Come on, the resemblance is uncanny. I'm sorry. Now, even though it's true that BlackRock does control trillions of dollars in assets, it's not their money it's their clients' money, and their clients are extremely wealthy. Like just to get started investing with BlackRock, you need to have at least a minimum of $250,000, but it goes up from there. Like if you invest $40 million, they'll lower their annual fee to just half a percent, and after 50 million, it's negotiable, but rumor has it, they'll do it for tree fitting. The point is, if you have a quarter million dollars laying around that you want invested, you can create an account with them today and you too can become a part of the global conspiracy to control the world. Because the next thing they're about to control, supposedly, is real estate. And this rumor has gotten so bad that they themselves put out a statement. And they say they want to make it perfectly clear that they are not buying individual homes in the US. They are, however, investing $120 billion for their clients into building houses, purely to rent them out for cash flow so that their clients could make money. But BlackRock themselves say they are not buying single family homes. So I'll leave BlackRock out of it for now, but I will come back to it because there are five other major institutions that do own a lot of houses and they are buying. But before I get to that, 
I did go to a real estate expert to ask his opinion on what's actually going on. All right, Graham, can you please explain why real estate is going up and it's not necessarily because of hedge funds? It's such a small percentage that in the big picture, it doesn't really make a difference. It's like you walking into a house and saying, oh, I'm not gonna buy this house because I don't like the paint color. Well, meanwhile, it's like falling off a cliff. Like that's not the reason you're bu you know, not buying the house. It's, it's so insignificant. So yes, they are, but it's not the types of real estate where it's like, you going and buying a house, you're going to miss out because BlackRock is going and making an offer slightly higher than you. Right. Why did you think Fox News canceled it and didn't air your episode? I don't think it makes it an exciting story. Honestly, I think it's it's better to get the people going with a story about a corporation who's putting one over on the mom and pop, you know, person who's buying a house. It, it, it makes people angry. And, you know, the truth is really not that exciting. It's that interest rates are really low. People were able to lock in rates at three to 4% fixed for 30 years. Rates are higher now. It doesn't make sense to sell. There's not enough inventory on the market. There's still some demand. So there's very few properties on the market for people to pick from, and that's keeping prices high. That's really as simple as it is. Now, up to this point in the video, I showed you a lot of evidence why institutions might not be the biggest reason why homes are becoming more expensive. But I also wanna share with you my opinion. And my opinion, is that institutions have a lot more to do with this than meets the eye and what shows up in our data. And let me show you why. There's a small but mighty group of companies that lead the industry. So Pretium is the parent company for a company called Progress Residential that owns about 90,000 homes. Uh, they were started by Don Mullen, who came out of Goldman Sachs' mortgage group. Invitation Homes was started by Blackstone, but Blackstone sold their position a long time ago. They own about 80,000 homes. American Homes for Rent, which was started by Wayne Hughes, they own about 60,000 homes. There's a company called Tricon Residential that's out of Canada. And then there's one called Amherst, those are the big five. Okay, so if you add all that up across five major institutions, that represents about 272,000 homes, which is a lot of houses, but remember, that is still only a small fraction, maybe one to 2% of the residential market. Institutions, large companies, only account for about 1% of all the rental housing in the United States and only about 2% of the single family rental housing. Except here's the thing I haven't seen anyone consider. Big money institutions are creating a market where builders are incentivized to build more rental properties for these institutions rather than building starter homes which contributes to the shortage of supply. And here's just a couple examples using the same five big institutions of how they're contributing to this problem. One of the biggest institutions, Progress Residential, paid $1.5 billion to DR Horton just this year to build them 4,000 rental homes. Another one, Invitation Homes, teamed up with Pulte Group to build them 7,500 rental homes. Another one, AMH American Homes, teamed up with JP Morgan Asset Management to build them more rental homes. And because these money institutions are partnering up with home builders, we're seeing less and less homes prioritized for normal people and more homes being built that are prioritized for investors as rental properties instead. And this isn't just my opinion, this data is verifiable. In the late 70s, early 80s, the United States routinely generated between three and 400,000 starter homes a year. In 2020, we generated 65,000. So after learning about all of this, here's my personal opinion, and I'm gonna upset both Fox News and CNN here. Because when we talk about investors, it's hard to form a baseline truth, because not everyone agrees what investor actually means. Like some people think that if you own less than nine houses, you're not a big investor. You're just a small mom and pop operation. Other people say you own nine houses, you are definitely part of the problem. How many is too many? Three, five, I don't know. But if you own just one rental property, you will be officially included in the big time investor statistic. Having said that though, I think Graham is absolutely right and his logic explains the majority of the reason why houses have become more expensive. Because interest rates have been at historic lows for more than a decade, which incentivize people to buy not just a starter house, but maybe an investment property or two. And now that prices are really high and interest rates are high, and since 90% of people are locked into an interest rate that's less than 6%, then it makes no sense to move. And thanks to inflation and material costs and zoning laws and bureaucracy, it's made it a lot more expensive for builders to build smaller, more affordable homes. And all of that is on the governments to blame, and builders had to get creative. 
I actually learned a couple years ago when I was trying to build a house, which I never ended up doing, that it didn't cost me that much more money to build a bigger house, especially if I went upward. So builders realized this a long, long time ago. That's why they are now prioritizing building a bigger house because it doesn't cost them that much more, but it does increase their profit margins. They figured out pretty early on, like it's pretty hard to be profitable when you're focusing on people who are missing payments all the time and living in 70 year old homes that need a lot of CapEx. So the, the Wall Street group has focused on newer homes and higher income tenants who are more discretionary renters, not, not out of necessity, because that's been a better profit model for them. When you add to that a shortage of affordable housing and low inventory and you get the answer, Answer. But that does not mean Wall Street isn't part of the problem because I think they are and here's exactly why. So let's just assume that Wall Street really does own only 1-2% to of houses. But then we have to ask ourselves what percent of that 2% is made up of starter homes? I was able to find data from 2021 and single family homes made up 74.8% of their investments with an average price of $432,000. That also happens to be close to the median price point of a home in the US, which means three out of four of their investments are targeted at price points that you and I would consider buying as a starter home. But still, that's only 2% of all the housing. So why then does it feel like that 2% has such a disproportionate effect on all the prices? Here's how I like to make sense of this. Okay, so you know how people say that the price of something is determined by supply and demand, basic economics. I also learned though that supply and demand does not exist in a market that has 100% demand and no supply. That's what's happening with oil. The entire world is running at 100% capacity. It demands energy all the time, and there's not a lot of reserves, except for Argentina, Saudi Arabia, and the Middle East, but those are reserves meant for emergencies and not for setting prices. Now, oil's price today is what it is because of something called spare production capacity. It's a fancy way of saying extra. He who has the extra makes the rules, because while the world is on its last drop consuming everything it gets its hands on, if you've got extra, you get to set the price. I think real estate in the US is now operating under similar kind of economics. It's in 100% demand and very little supply. So who controls the price? He who has the extra. Who has the extra? Investors have the extra and builders can build the extra, which they're not doing right now because investors are incentivizing those builders to instead prioritize building rental properties for them instead. And that plays no small role in removing their incentives for building starter homes that normal people can afford. And when that 1 or 2% demand from Wall Street is so highly concentrated in areas where investors see the most opportunity for growth, aka the houses that are most affordable, and you get this situation where people are rightfully upset because it affects the price point that matters most. And because bureaucracy and governments just stand in the way and they don't help and they make it more expensive for everyone else to build, builders just charge us more money. So right there, we can blame bureaucracy, we can blame the builders, and we can blame investors. So when Wall Street comes along and buys our little 1% extra, in my opinion, if we removed Wall Street out of the equation, it would give the market just a little bit of breathing room. How much would that lower prices? I don't know, I'm not an economist, I couldn't even begin to tell you how to calculate that number. But 2% demand can make or break the difference between creating a market that is reasonable, one that's governed by basic supply and demand economics, and a market that makes no sense at all. That's just my very unprofessional and very uneducated opinion. Now I have to say that it's always been really hard for me to make real estate videos because there are so many moving parts and so many variables and I feel so overwhelmed. And I try not to be one of those people that buys into a simple narrative like it's an evil corporation. I try to look at data. But sometimes I think there's important nuances behind the data that I sometimes overlook 
and that's what I tried to show and hopefully explain. And I also want to clarify that in this video, I'm not saying that I'm right and I explained all of it, but it is something that's always been on my mind that I've had trouble with, so I'd love to know what you think about all of this. Did I do okay? Is there something that I missed? Let me know what you think, and as always, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Smash the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, don't forget to grab your free stocks, links are down below, and then go track them automatically with the spreadsheet link down below in my Patreon. Love you, thank you so much for watching this video, I'd love to see you back here on Monday and Friday, sometimes a Wednesday, see you soon, bye bye.